and is a faculty member in our Department of uh, Meteorology. Uh, he, back in the early, late, late 1980s, uh, worked on a proposal uh, when the first of the, the first round of the National Science Foundation uh, Science and Technology Centers was set up. And so he um, and a colleague of his, uh, Doug Lilly, um, from the National Academy submitted a proposal and OU was one of the first 11 of the science and technology centers that were established in this country. Um, and they, he established and then ran the Center for Analysis and Prediction of Storms, which continues today. Uh, we're actually, the Climate Science Center is actually working with them on some very high resolution uh, downscaled, uh, dynamically downscaled uh, uh, products. And from uh, operating the uh, Center for Analysis and Prediction of Storms, he has a long list, very long list of other um, uh, large grants uh, that he was uh, a leader in, um, very long list of membership in a lot of organizations. Um, but the one that we asked him uh, to talk about today is his appointment in the, uh, on the National Science Board. So the National Science Board uh, members are, uh, are appointed by the President of the United States and it's to provide input for our nation's science policies. He was appointed first under the Bush administration and then again under the Obama administration. Um, he's currently vice chair of the uh, National Science Board in a very illustrious position. Um, he is one of the uh, um, most uh, thoughtful, inquisitive, um, collaborative, and um, supportive people that I know. Um, if you have any chance to get to know him, just an amazing, amazing scientist, but more so an amazing person. That said, I do have pictures of him on his 30th birthday with um, a, uh, a, a stuffed alien clinging, a uh, little uh, stuffed animal clinging to his ear. And I probably have a lot of other pictures of him that he would not want uh, uh, shown. He was uh, my master's advisor. He was Derek's uh, master's advisor. And so um, I've known him for uh, 25 years. Uh, I asked him, and I have it confirmed on my uh, phone, if he would do no slides. And he said, I can do a talk with no slides. So let's watch his talk with no slides today. So please welcome him. Bergemeyer. He's also our uh, Vice President for Research for the University of Oklahoma. And probably, uh, other than uh, maybe some of the people who were uh, helpful in writing the proposals, uh, one of the people who ensured that the Climate Science Center was here. So he, he stepped up and provided cash on our plates that we can use every year. Actually, some of that cash pays for Derek's salary. So, oh, wow. So Derek, cash is good. Derek in this workshop exists because of Kelvin's <laughs> Renee, thank you for that incredibly gracious introduction. I, you know, Renee came to OU, I think it was like in 87 or 88 from Wisconsin, you know, and uh, very, very clearly outstanding person. I'm so proud of all that she's done. Uh, she is truly a leader at the university. We have a lot of very outstanding faculty. We have very few people who can do what she's done in terms of building interdisciplinary teams, getting folks aligned, and things like that, and, and executing a very bold mission and vision for, in this case, the, Cloud, the South Central Climate Science Center. So I'm, I'm extremely proud of her and, and very, very pleased to be here and really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. Um, I also, to put it in perspective, um, you have, you're at a unique moment in time, uh, not only in terms of the work that you're doing, but in terms of an opportunity in this point in your career to really get an understanding of all the things that, just like what Joe just talked about, the exciting work that's going on, but also policy. I mean, 
this work that you're doing is right at the center of, of national policy. And so the opportunity to kind of talk a little bit about what policy is and how it actually comes into existence and how it's monitored and how it's changed and how it's enforced and so on is really, really important. So I think it's fabulous that, that the folks, uh, all of you collectively in the Climate Science Center, had this thoughtful vision to come together today and spend some time talking about this because it's fantastic and it's going to really bode well for you, I think, in the future. So I'm going to spend just a few minutes and some slides to have a very interactive conversation with you, I hope. Uh, so I, I don't want to get in lecture mode and just talk all the time, so please throw, if, if it weighs less than a pound, you can throw it at me, otherwise, you know, just sort of uh, get my attention some way, because I really would like to talk to you about this and really have a, a conversation about policy. I have to be a little careful, as Renee said, I am a, a member and the vice chair of the National Science Board, so I want to make sure that everyone knows that I'm um, not representing the science board here. We speak as a board of the whole but I am going to be talking about the board, so I have to be a little bit careful to always put the disclaimer to say I'm operating as a faculty member here and not as a, as a representative of, uh, of NSF. Um, so I, it's important, I think, to step back when we talk about policy and look at the big picture of where we are as a nation and a world. Um, right now, the U.S. still leads the world in, uh, in research and development expenditures. Expenditures are a metric that's important because it shows the money that's in action. So when we talk about an expenditure, it means a dollar spent to fund research, to fund a grant, the Climate Science Center, it's money that's in action. And so this is a, a, a history uh, over about, oh, I don't know what, what, 20, 15, uh, 25 years, something like that, in constant 2011 dollars. And of course, the U.S., it shows, is, is clearly in the lead. It's clearly in the lead in terms of, of dollars spent on R&D. But look at the curve that shows China. This, uh, this kind of, uh, I don't know if this will be bright enough, but that, that kind of, uh, uh, goldenrod color curve, it's, it's going up pretty dramatically. I was actually just in a meeting with some visitors from Tsinghua University in, the, in Beijing, which is one of the, the most outstanding universities in China. It's very interesting to hear how they're investing and they want to partner with OU and stuff, but China is tearing it up. I mean, they're really coming on the scene, building facilities, hiring people, funding, funding researchers in the U.S. and so on. But U.S. still leads the world by about a factor of two, uh, but you can see in terms of the trends, the delta of the growth here, China, South Korea, also, India and Germany are really investing very, very, very heavily. This is fantastic. It's wonderful to see other countries, especially emerging nations, really getting in there and investing. The challenge, of course, is how do we maintain our lead in the United States as a, as a real force in, the, in research and development? If you actually now look at these investments as normalized by our gross domestic product, which is essentially our economic activity, our vitality, you see the U.S. is, uh, is over here kind of kind of flat, you know, but it's still well above China, which is this curve here, but notice how China is, in, is, uh, is increasing. So on the, on the Hill and in the White House, folks look at this from a policy perspective and say, you know, are we investing enough? How much is enough? What areas should we invest in? And so on from a very, very global picture, not just looking at climate science and things like that, but overall the R&D vitality of our country. Um, it gets a little bit scary when you start to parse this out a little bit as the federal R&D, again, is a percent of our gross domestic product broken out by the total, which is the top curve, and then development, basic research in blue, and then the bottom are facilities. And you don't see trends that are terribly encouraging to you. And uh, you look at this and you say, well, you know, what is our federal policy for research? What is our, our science policy and what should it be? The curves kind of bounce around. And this is a very, very long time series, uh, you know, about 40-year period almost. Um, but overall, if you squint your eyes, you see sort of a downward trend. And that, that's of concern when you see these other countries you know, really building their enterprises, and the U.S. is getting kind of, um, kind of timid. Um, so when we talk about policy, and I'm fascinated by policy, because is it, what is policy? Um, who determines what the policy should be, and who actually enforces it, okay? It doesn't have the power of law, so it's not like you can get thrown in jail for it, but there is policy, and there is an enforcement mechanism, and, and once policy is there, how do you change it, and how do we actually avoid bad policy? Now, I'm not going to give you a comprehensive view. In fact, people in... Uh, uh, in Joe's department in political science, you know, they, they teach entire courses on this. So this is kind of a very, very quick overview of it. But if you actually look it up in the dictionary, it's always kind of fun when you're talking about something to say, well, what does a dictionary say about this? A plan or course of action to try to influence or determine decisions or action. It's some guiding principle or procedure that we all agree to live by, okay? And um, that's sort of the base, uh, base definition of it. Um, in academia, uh, all of us, you all are working on your degrees or your postdocs or whatever, there are lots of policies. Your doctoral qualifying exam. There's a policy for when you have to do that and so on. Uh, private use of the university internet, you're not supposed to use it for bad things. Uh, use of cell phones, if you own a university cell phone, make up exams. I, I create policies in my class and say if you, know, if, you, if you turn in your homework late or whatever, there's a certain penalty. So policies sort of happen everywhere. 
sexual harassment, nepotism, all kinds of policies in academia that we have to live by. So those policies are pretty clear. It's pretty clear who enforces them. The university has rules and regulations. And when policies are violated, there are consequences. And it's fairly clear, including the ethical uh, conduct of research, that's where I come in. In fact, if there's a researcher that does something bad, you know, and that's happened before, then they have to, you know, be reviewed and we investigate and there might be sanctions uh, all the way up to abrogation of tenure. So there are all those kinds of policies. Public policy is a little bit different, okay? And it, it's this process that draws out this collective wisdom, this a, a, a diverse group of people to reach a public goal that typically is a very positive goal. So the, the diverse group could be the entire society, okay? Ultimately, like, what is our policy on energy or climate change and who decides that? Well, to what what extent does the nation, does the public have a role in deciding what that policy ought to be? Well, certainly the electoral system is one mechanism, but there are others. The interesting thing, though, it says at the bottom, we as researchers generate and disseminate new knowledge. That's, that's a domain of, of our life. That's what we do. That's not what policy is. Policy doesn't involve that. It involves the use of that knowledge that we generate as researchers. And I want to talk about how that actually happens. So a lot of the examples now going from academia to, say, the national stage, what are some of the policy issues we deal with. Well, of course, immigration is, is one. Gun control, things like climate change, education standards, the so-called common core. Oklahoma just voted that down. The governor voted that down or you know, vetoed the bill. So now we're on a different track. Um, social services, storage of nuclear waste. Um, the folks that, uh, that Joe uh, works with, uh, Carol, uh, Carol Silva and Hank Jenkins-Smith, they had to do a lot of work with, uh, with Sandia National Lab, where I was at yesterday. And it's all on the policy of nuclear waste. And it's, it's looking at social attitudes and societal attitudes toward that, which informs public policy. So lots of things, stem cells, cloning, all those kinds of things, which are, which are policies of the nation that we have to somehow decide. And we have to agree as a society that this is what we want to have. Well, policy is not. And it's interesting to talk about the obverse. It's not law. OK, it's not law. Now, sometimes policy can come from law, or laws can create policy. But at the end of the day, law is law. <laughs> legislation is legislation. And policy is something apart from law that is essentially set by agencies or certain aspects of society, but does not have the force of law. So that, that causes you to ask, well, so how, how is policy enforced if it's not law? Okay, and we'll come to that. So developing science policy is, is interesting. Um, first of all, a lot of times policy, like about climate change, needs to be informed by research, by science, supposedly, right? Um, you look at the scientific output and you say, okay, now we know the facts. So scientists, our role is to discover and communicate facts and uncertainties. And the uncertainties part is very, very important and something we don't do particularly well. In fact, meteorology, my discipline, has done more to cause confusion among the public about what the probability that word means <laughs> than anything else. You have 30% chance of rain. What the heck does that mean? It's not a statistically meaningful thing today. <clears throat> and so we, you know, or the temperature is five degrees above normal. Well, people freak out at that. Well, we're abnormal. Well, of course we're abnormal. Yeah. It's, it's the mean, it's the average, it's not normal. So we've not contributed very effectively to that conversation about, uh, about the word probability. But our role is really to communicate the facts and the uncertainties. Policy analysts, there's a group of folks called policy analysts. What they basically do is they take the facts, okay, and they, they sort of comport those with the values of society held by various sectors, whether it's you know, individual communities, whether it's a corporate world, whatever. And they frame the problem like climate change, and they come up with possible courses of action, okay? And that might involve, um, you know, any, anywhere from, say, creating a carbon tax or putting scrubbers on coal plants or whatever, some of which have very, very significant financial consequences. They don't make the decisions, but they basically take the research results, put it in the context of, of public values, and then they say, all right, here's, here are a number of possible options. Um, now, the policymakers, which could be lawmakers, but oftentimes it's not. Policy is oftentimes made by officials within agencies. They look at the significance and they make value judgments of various courses of action. So I say, okay, well, yeah, you know, we could do a carbon tax, but, um, but you know, that's going to harm this sector of the economy or whatever. And they, they sort of make these value judgments, which are kind of squishy, okay? Here's the really hardcore scientific method of why things reject arbitrary um, notions and things like that. Whereas now, as you get further down the list, it's sort of things a little bit more squishy. They become a little bit more qualitative and more judge, judgment driven. And then finally, once policy is, is, fact, is, is enacted, which eventually happens by policy makers because they make the policy, then there are communicators. And this is really, really important, this last piece. And this is why communication science is so critical to the kind of work that you are doing. It's not just social behavioral science, ecology, climate science, and things. It's actually communication because of how we actually communicate the 
policy, the consequences of it, and things like that. Helps the public understand, and Joe could just go on and on about this, I think, uh, in terms of how the, how the general public really comprehends and embraces or doesn't embrace various policies. So, of course, some of the, the things that we deal with right now, some of the big challenges, climate change policy uh, right now in the House Science Committee, uh, there's, a, in fact, it's going to probably be in the Senate as well, uh, a, a cutback of $50 million, $50 million in the, uh, the budget at the National Science Foundation for climate research. It's entirely political. It has absolutely nothing to do with research. But that's a policy that, that Congress has decided, well, we're not going to fund climate science at the extent that, to the extent that we, uh, we did before. Stem cell research, things like hydraulic fracturing. Here in Oklahoma, we're having swarms of earthquakes. Um, is that natural, or is it driven by deep water injection wells that are putting drilling wastewater three miles deep in the, uh, in the, in the earth? And then is that, is that uh, causing some lubrication along pre-existing small fault lines and causing earthquakes? Well, you know, all of our experience is based on just how long we've been around, not geologic time scale. But anybody that lives here will tell you, we've never had earthquakes in Oklahoma. Oh, this is crazy. Of course we have. But there are these dramatic increases. And so what is the policy then of the state of Oklahoma in terms of allowing companies to do this kind of thing? Because people don't have earthquake insurance. And if their foundations are cracking, who's going to pay for it and who's responsible? Those are some of the policy issues that we deal with uh, at the national level. So if you think about policy, I like to think of it in terms of an uh, iron triangle. We have policymakers and legislators. Okay, Sometimes policy is law. You have researchers. And then you have advocates and lobbyists for policy. The, um, the policymakers basically don't want to do things that are going to be out of sync or out of step with their constituents. So they want to make decisions that, that, that you know, basically aren't going to prevent them from getting reelected, first and foremost. So in some sense, they say, well, look, I don't know enough about this topic, so let's do more research. So oftentimes, it's like, OK, we don't know. Let's do a study. <laughs> now, the scientific community sort of likes to hear that, because it's like, OK, you know, more funding. But sometimes we tend to study things to death. But in fact, that's, there's value in that. So research is we get money to expand knowledge and help resolve policy issues. Uh, various studies that go into the International uh, uh, the Intergovernmental Agency on uh, uh, Intergovernmental Program on Climate Change and so on, that sort of thing, is very, very important. Uh, so we try to present the results. And of course, activists and lobbyists haven't really talked much about this, but there are people out there who, and it could be just a private citizen who's advocating for something, or a professional licensed lobbyist. Um, registered lobbyist that goes out there and says, OK, I'm being paid by Shell Oil to take a position that says fracking is fine. And then what they say is, OK, what scientific data do I have to support my position? The legislators and policy makers are doing the same thing for various reasons. They might say, well, you know, I have a position on this as, a, as say, uh, maybe Department of Energy says, well, we really want the we want the truth, but on the other hand, we sort of do have a position because we are a part of a cabinet agency, which is part of the executive branch, which is what the president wants. So this particular president now is very much in favor of alternative energy. So you have these folks sometimes at odds with one another, ultimately wanting uh, information that supports their position. The scientists are over off to the side, the ones who really try to tell the truth and say, this is reality, and then they provide that information and these folks use it. There's a problem with that model, though, in, in the sense that these folks use the science, and the scientists tend to be over here, not much involved with the policy process. That's a problem. Okay? Not in the sense that you want policy or you want politics to influence your science. You absolutely don't. You never want that to happen. You want to stay clean and pristine and pure as a researcher. But you can't completely isolate yourself from the existence of policy and understand how the work you're doing could inform policy. I'm going to come back to that here in just a second in terms of all the roles that we can play collectively. So because of all this, because of that, that sort of uh, tension, then a lot of this, this debate that we need to have okay, about, about things like climate change, it gets pushed to the side. And all of a sudden, the politicians get in there and start, as you well know, I think, especially in terms of climate, you know, dealing with character assassination. And so there is this war zone of policy analysis versus political advocacy in terms of how do we actually make a well-informed policy that is driven not by arbitrary decisions and arbitrary thinking, but by well-informed scientific results that are then analyzed and put in a context of the value proposition for society and the right decisions made. You're not going to ever please everyone. But what I've seen in my many years of working on the Hill and testifying before Congress and stuff, stuff is really arbitrary. You, you really get up there, you do all this analysis. In the 11th hour, somebody makes a horse trade over here. They put money here, and you're like, 
all this work, and it just, in, in, in two minutes, they make it, well, let's put a billion here and a half billion here. Let's cut this back to a quarter and put that other three billion over here. Done. Oh, my gosh. You know, as researchers, we don't work that way. It's completely crazy. So it's interesting when you look at the process, when you have policy analysis, which basically takes research outcomes and looks at the scope of possibilities. It, it sort of is a, is a funnel that goes outward. It says, here's the issue. And they try to increase all the range of possible decisions by associating all the scientific results with a range of choices, all the possibilities of renewable energy and stuff. There's, there's a, you know, unlimited array of things. So they take it, they take the issue, and they try to provide a big array of solutions. If you look on the other direction, pol political advocacy does just the opposite. It says, here's the position I have, and I want to take this particular choice, and it narrows everything down to say, what bits and pieces can I find in terms of all the range of alternatives that really support my particular view. And that's, that's, they're completely sort of opposite. They're not competing with one another, but they're completely, completely opposite. Um, so, of course, global warming. Um, the IPCC, it really doesn't assess the results in the context of policy. It just tells a story. Here's the, they use very, very careful wording. Here's what we think is going to happen. Here's the range of uncertainty, so on and so forth. So then the various advocates, lobbyists and stuff, you know, they interpret that information, and they try to, if you want to use the word spin, or try to you know, direct those outcomes to fit anybody's particular view. The problem, though, is that there's a lot of politiz politiz politization, I guess is the right way to say it, politization of, of this uh, sort of issue. So it's no longer just scientific results and thoughtful policy analysis of what is society willing to accept. There are deep ideological divides. Okay? And that, it's not that that's never happened before, but there's a real challenge with climate science because, and I got asked this in a seminar I gave at Sandia two days ago, the very first question after I gave a talk on storm modeling and stuff, well, what do you think about climate change? I said, well, you know, um, the models tell us what they tell us, and they're not perfect. And if we're intellectually honest with one another, we'll say, yeah, the observations show the planet is warming. The evidence of the models suggests that it's human-induced or there's a strong human signal. But we don't know everything there is to know about the nitrogen cycle, about all the carbon cycling, all this stuff, carbon sequestration. We don't know. I can tell you my model is very, very imperfect. I'm not a climate scientist. But if we're intellectually honest, we will say we don't know, but here's what the models are telling us. And, and frankly, unfortunately, a lot of the scientific community has gotten to the point where they're saying, you're, and, and actually, Joe touched on this, you're an idiot if you go out up there and say what I just said to you. How can you say that, Calvin? How can you say we don't know? It's obvious. It's like... If you say that, you're not a scientist, because science is never, ever that certain. So I'm very skeptical of people who take that almost deeply ideological position of, we absolutely know the answer. No, we don't. Look at the, the deep rise in oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, right? Massive, catastrophic, environmental disaster beyond all proportion. Where's oil? It got eaten by microbes. Guess what? We didn't know those microbes existed, and they had the capacity to do that. It's gone. There's no catastrophe. Yeah, there's oil on the shores and stuff. But the atmosphere is incredibly resilient. The planet's incredibly resilient. So what do I feel about it? Well, my feeling is the planet, you can kick it in the butt really, really hard, and it will come back. Is there a tipping point for climate change? I don't know. The only thing that we can say for certain is we have our model results. The models are as good as they are, and that's what we know. Okay? That's the intellectually honest answer. But yet, as Joe pointed out, a lot of people don't allow that debate to happen. Right? If, you, if you even start down that road, some people just kind of go crazy. So I say all that to say I think there needs to be a different approach. As I mentioned before, scientists, we typically avoided political influence on our research. That's absolutely true. Don't ever, ever let politics guide the decisions you make or the outcomes as you analyze them and say, well, this result is, is what it is. But man, if I report that in the journal, oh, you know, and I, I think you, you obviously know that. But we can't work in a vacuum. We can't just take our results, toss them over the wall, and hope that some policy analyst is going to understand it and get it. Because guess what? They're 25, 30, maybe 26, 27 years old. They're not researchers. They don't understand this stuff. We have to go in there and help them a lot. So we have to be aware of implications but not be influenced by it. And that means we have to be very much more active than we are today to understand the purpose and explain the purpose and the value of our, of our research. And that's something that we all have a collective responsibility to do. So, how do we go about doing that then? Well, there are sort of two ways, formal and informal, in which uh, the government uh, sort of gets advised, if you will, on policy. All the things you see here, lobbyists, professional societies, trade organizations, so all the way down to individual citizens, ways in which you can provide input to the government in terms of, 
of policy and, and, and you know, actions that you think need to be taken. So there's a whole variety of ways that this can happen. Formally, on the other hand, there are a lot of much more formal mechanisms. There are a lot of organizations within the federal government process. I'll talk just about a few of these. There are organizations that exist for the sole purpose of analyzing you know, a variety of outcomes of policy, so on and so forth. They do what I was talking about before. They do that analysis. They say, OK, here's a spectrum of outcomes. And then it's up to the policy makers to really make the decision working with society to try to understand the implications. I came upon this chart just the other day, and I thought it was hilarious, actually. Um, it would have been a lot better with colored, uh, colored lines. But what it really shows you is this isn't easy. <laughs> this is complicated. Um, and, and just to show you a little bit, on the left here is, are the fields of science, right? So you have psychology, social science, and they're all, of course, stovepipe because that's how the world is right now. Um, you have the federal agencies and departments here that are in one way or another doing research or funding research. And then you have these national science technology committees I'll come to in a minute. And over here you have all the political process of, of uh, authorization and appropriation of funding. And you look at that and you say, OK, how do we actually decide? <laughs> how do we decide what, you know, in terms of climate science, Department of Energy, Department of Interior, NOAA, NASA, they all fund climate research. Are they talking to one another? Is there redundancy? Are we, you know, funding the same thing? Well, you know, whatever. There's no real clarity in the, in the overall process here for, as a nation, how we actually determine science policy and actually fund it. And I'll come back to that at the very last point where there's an effort in a way that I think could actually uh, fix that or improve it. Um, one of the organizations I want you to be familiar with um, as researchers is called OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology. Oh, it's spelled back, not OTSP. OSTP, Office of Science and Technology Policy. I guess I'm dyslexic. Um, this is, a, is an agency within the White House. Uh, it is uh, led by the uh, President's Science Advisor, in this case, John Holdren. Uh, and it basically has organizations within it that range from, as you see here, life sciences, engineering, physical sciences, technology, so on and so forth, space and astronautics. And they're the ones who really sit at the very high level of the federal government and look at the policies for science in the nation. Okay, these are all presidential appointees, most of them confirmed by the Senate. And they're very, very important because they, although they, but they are the executive branch. They're not legislative. So these are the folks that, at the executive branch level, deal with science policy. Um, so that's one important organization to be aware of. And, and the director right now, John Holder, is a terrific guy. He's a Harvard professor, fabulous, very, very smart. Uh, and he does a great job of running uh, that organization. Right now, unfortunately, most of the positions are interim. There's only one confirmed associate director in the whole organization. So it's in kind of a state of flux right now. Another very important committee that I want your counsel, I want you to be aware of, in addition to OSTP, is the NSTC, the National Science and Technology Council. This is a council that is made entirely of government agencies. Okay, uh, so there's there's you know all the agencies I showed you. Think of climate science. Uh, there's a group on Earth observations and stuff. The, the committees within the natural resources, science, technology, and uh, homeland and national security. So in these various things, you'll find. Uh, dimensions of science, climate science, natural disasters, things like that. And their role is basically to get the agencies to talk to one another and to decide how they're going to work together and, you know, the, the various, you know, policies of, you know, funding priorities, research priorities, how much money in climate change, how much money in this or that. And they're a very important um, entity, but they have no involvement of academia or the private sector. It's purely government uh, agencies. So OSTP, NSTC, and another one that I want you to be aware of, and I think you probably are, are the National Academies. Um, the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and uh, the Institute of Medicine, these were established by Lincoln, actually, when he was president. And they are a nonprofit organization that exists out there basically to advise the nation in the most credible, unpoliticized way possible about all issues related to science, technology, and medicine. And so you've heard people say, and, and Renee mentioned that Doug Lilly is a member of the National Academy of Sciences. This is the preeminent sort of thing that you get elected to as a researcher in, in those three areas. Uh, and, and then, you know, there's basically a, a large body of people who get together and, and meet and they have good food and stuff like that. But they, they also talk a lot about, you know, where we're going as a nation. And so the, the important part of this is the National Research Council is the operating arm of the National Academies. They are the ones who go out and do studies. Okay, and I'll show you some of these here in a minute. Um, these studies can be requested by federal agencies, by Congress, by anybody, and they cost. You have to go pay the National Academies to do this because they don't get money from the federal government. They're purely a soft money organization. And so they go through and they study these things in great detail. Typically, they take a year and a half to two years. So that's the drawback. Very authoritative, thoughtful, deep studies about things like 
you know, climate change, about biological systems, about, you know, the aviation transport system, things like that. Um, and then two years down the road, they come out with a lot of recommendations, and they're just fabulous. They're absolutely fabulous. So this is the go-to place where you really want an authoritative study that is completely untainted, and that's the National Academies and the National Research Council. And here's some, some examples of, of recent uh, reports. Advancing the Science of Climate Change, that's an NRC report. One done recently jointly between the National Academies and the Royal Society, Climate Change, Evidence, and Causes. So they go through and they look at these kinds of things, and again, they make recommendations that oftentimes are uh, put into policy by the agencies that fund the studies. And they're completely apolitical, completely apolitical. The final one is the Council on Environmental Quality. I just want you to be aware of. This is within the office of the executive, office of the president, within the White House. And they deal with lots and lots of issues of environmental policies, EPA kinds of things, federal agency policies about land use and all this sort of thing. Uh, there's actually a former student of OU, an undergraduate, who was a high official in this, um, and he's now moved on to working at the National Renewable Energy Lab in Colorado. But this is a very, very important organization. And an opportunity for some of you who want to actually do policy stuff to go to Washington and spend time in these offices. And I want to come back to that later on in terms of what is your role. You could actually play a role of being, say, a rotator, a position that maybe, you know, two, spend two or four years there, or you actually go there for your career. And it used to be that researchers that get PhDs or master's degrees, well, if you, if you don't have anything else better to do with your life, I guess you'd go to Washington and be a policy person. <laughs> Who'd want to do that? That's a very noble calling, folks. It's a very noble calling, and it's one that we are really encouraging students to do. In fact, one of Renee's recent doctoral students, Kim Cloco, finished her PhD about a year ago. She's been uh, a year in uh, Senator Markey's office, I believe. And now she's looking, pardon? Merkley. 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 And now she's going on to do other things. But she was there doing policy in Washington straight out of a PhD program. I love that. That's fantastic. We don't need everybody that comes out with a PhD to go be a professor or you know, be a researcher. We, Lord knows we don't have nearly enough thoughtful policy folks in Washington. Um, how do we actually get the broader community input on policy? Well, there's, one, there's many mechanisms, but this is an important one, the so-called federal register. This is a, an entity within the government that's existed for a long, long time. Um, and it puts out basically policies that the government is considering enacting, and then it uh, provides an opportunity for, for anybody, including just citizens, to provide input. So you'll see one of these things here, like, oh, what in the heck is that? It's called the Advanced Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. So somebody's going to create a rule or a policy. In this case, it's on uh, uh, grants and cooperative agreements for universities in terms of how we charge dollars and stuff. It's very important for us. Very detailed stuff, but you can read these things and provide input, and the agencies take that input and they use it to, to actually craft the policy. So they, they sort of have a start right here, and then you say, okay, well, I don't agree with that for these reasons. And frankly, the agencies pay a lot of attention to this. They really do. They're not obligated to listen to you. They're not obligated to tell you, here's what we thought of your comments or whatever, but it's a great opportunity for you to actually provide uh, input. But finally, I just want to mention, as Renee asked, the National Science Board, which is an important and very interesting organization. It's quite different than, than any other entity in the federal government. Um, and it, it had its origins in the Manhattan Project back in World War II, where, of course, we had this really intensive effort to build the, uh, the atomic bomb. And, and all, many, many scientists from all over the country were brought together at Los Alamos to actually do this work. And some of them stayed at Columbia, and some of them were at Oak Ridge, and various places like that. But at the end of the day, there was this transformation of thinking in the country. It's like the scientists won the war. I mean, this $2 billion project helped us completely win the war. They saved the world. And so the sense was, wow, these folks are heroes. We've got to support science. We clearly have to support research because all the stuff that went into the bombs, the basics of nuclear physics and stuff, nobody was thinking about building a bomb when they were looking at fission, fusion, and stuff. It's like, oh, but, oh, wow, this could be used to build a bomb. And that troubled a lot of scientists. But at the end of the day, the government realized this notion of basic research was so critical for the future of our country. So there was this thing called OSRD, the Office of Scientific Research and Development. It was actually created to fund research projects uh, within the university community after, after the war was over. And all the scientists went, obviously some stayed at Los Alamos, but a lot of them went back to Chicago and all their universities. And, and the federal government said, you know, we need to fund research. And so the guy who really made this happen was President Roosevelt's science advisor. His name is Vanny Varbush. And um, he said, you know, he wrote this manifesto called um, The uh, Science, the Endless Frontier. It's online. I would I really encourage you to read it. But it is what ended up creating the National Science Foundation. And the philosophy was the federal government has an absolute moral obligation to fund basic research at universities because private companies and, and you know, other sectors of society 
there's no other way to take the risk of funding stuff that might not have some practical use, but we have to fund basic research. So this is a wonderful read. It's not a super long book, but it's a wonderful vision that is still valid today. So Vannie Var Bush wrote that, and uh, in the, by the, uh, the mid-40s, funding for research at universities was, was dramatically rising, and it has continued sort of until the recent, uh, recent time. The NSF today, it's a fairly small agency by federal standards. It has a budget now about $7.2 billion. But what is unique about it, exclusive of medical science and clinical medicine, it funds all areas of science and engineering research, basic research, very basic science. Fundamental questions about the nature of the universe, the nature of matter, the nature of how people behave and react and so on, you go to NSF to, uh, to, get, that, uh, to get that funding. So it's a very, very important organization. Um, the science board, on the other hand, is interesting because it's also part of the NSF. So the Organic Act of NSF, the thing that created it, said NSF shall consist of a science board and a director. That's basically all it said. So the National Science Board is not an advisory body. It is actually part of the NSF. And it is the oversight body that establishes the policies. There's that word again, policy. The policies of the National Science Foundation oversees and guides all the activities and establishes all of, of how the NSF works. But the other flip side of that is, and this is the important part, the Science Board is an independent body that advises the President and Congress. And it's not aligned with a cabinet agency. It doesn't fall under interior or energy or any other defense. It's not in a cabinet agency. So in other words, it's independent and it can speak the truth, just like the National Academy. So one of the beautiful things about being on the Science Board is that if there's some very challenging issue out there that we need to think hard about and perhaps make some decision about policy. We can go tell it like it is. Even though we're presidential appointees, we're not part of the executive branch in the sense of that we're not tied to the president's policies. Sometimes that creates tension, okay? Because the NSF director, like us, is presidentially appointed. We're confirmed at the Senate. But the director of NSF has to be much more aligned with the president's policies. The science board doesn't have to be. So you can see that there can be tension between the board and the director, between the board and the White House. And that happens. But too bad. Too bad. You know, we are creating, in fact, the nation needs people who can speak authoritatively without political influence. That's essentially what we do. And so there are many examples of a board that reports that, in fact, policies that we've passed that other agencies say, wow, NSF is doing that. We're going to do it too. So NSF is really a flagship agency because of its peer review process that is, is the gold standard in the world. And so once we make decisions about certain science policies, other groups tend to line up. There is bad policy, though, a lot of it out there, I can tell you. How in the world do we protect ourselves from that? And I'll just give you one example. There's an organization called COGER, Council on Governmental Relations, and it is a consortium of over 200 universities and medical colleges that basically we pay to be a member of COGER. And its sole function is to basically look at policies and see if they're going to be effective or not in the context of research universities. That's what they're about. It's an incredibly powerful and wonderful organization. In fact, it's so good that the, the federal government agencies tend to come to COGER and say, we have this idea. We're, gonna, we're thinking about doing this. Give us a read. How is the community going to react to this? Are they going to just like freak out or whatever? So Coger has built a wonderful trust relationship with federal agencies to where it's not a watchdog, but it is an organization that says, look, policies need to be thoughtfully developed, carefully executed, and they have to have a positive outcome. And what's happening now is there's a lot of policies that are creating enormous burdens for, for researchers in universities in terms of administrative overhead to administering grants and stuff. And that's something we've been working very closely with COGAR on, and we're seeing some dramatic change happen because of that. Inside the government, that's a, that's a university consortium, inside the government there's also an organization called the Government Accountability Office, GAO, that basically does the same thing. It's, it sort of, it, it works on behalf of Congress, but it's not part of Congress, and it's not politically motivated. So they too will go in and, and do studies, and they essentially are a government agency that looks at the government and says, okay, are you doing things the right way. Government accountability. We hear a lot about accountability and transparency these days. This is a part of the government that looks at the government and says, are you doing it right? Very, very important. Um, one of the interesting things, though, if you look at that, that graph I showed you earlier with all the lines on it and stuff, you say, wow, it's, it's chaotic. It's true. Uh, and it's the irony of this country that we have such a robust and incredibly you know, world-class science enterprise, but in terms of science policy, we fly by the seat of our pants all the time. We really do. Even at NSF, I was stunned when I became a member of the science board 10 years ago, and we were talking about various things, you know, the budgets and stuff, and they're like, well, you know, we want to get the success rates up, we want to get the grant sizes up, so let's tweak some of these knobs. We had boatloads of data as a science foundation, and we weren't doing anything scientific to analyze 
results that would inform our policy making. So Jack Marburger, who's a president, uh, President Bush's science advisor several years ago, said we need a science, a science and innovation policy. We need to do research on science policy so that we can learn how to do effective policy. There's a program even to this day at NSF <clears throat> that's out there that people can propose to. And in fact, this is something that you might want to think about here in terms of climate policy. You could actually write a proposal as part of the Climate Science Center to NSF to say, you know, there are things that, that we want to study in terms of the concept of science policy with regard to climate change or ecological systems or social behavioral uh, uh, you know, dimensions of, of climate change. So that's an important thing. Um, how do we all become involved with policy? Well, there's a lot of ways. Um, as citizens, you can all go meet with members of Congress. And I don't know if this is something you'll have planned to do as part of the Climate Science Center, but you easily could, at some point, if you're having meetings in Washington, take a small delegation and go visit with the congressional members of all the, you know, New Mexico and Oklahoma and Texas and Louisiana, Arkansas, and get all those folks together and, uh, and go talk to, 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 uh, to uh, members of Congress or their staffs. And they also have local offices, remember, in their districts, so you don't have to go to Washington, you can actually meet with them there. Um, and I'll come back to, okay, what do I say if I get there? Serving as a AAAS fellow in federal agencies. This is what Kim did, right? Renee, wasn't she a AAAS fellow? Very, very prestigious, incredibly prestigious. You know, not many people get picked to do this, but they get this immersive experience in, as a fellow in a federal agency doing policy as Kim was doing in a congressional office, but you might be within some agency like the National Science Foundation. I work with these folks all the time, and they're extraordinary. Tremendous experience. Doesn't mean you can't go on to be a faculty member or a researcher or whatever, but you can take a little bit of diversion before you buy a house and start to have kids, you know, where you go to Washington for a year or two and, and you actually have this experience. You can serve on agency boards and committees. There's lots and lots of boards and committees that you can serve on. Um, typically not so much as a student, but as a practicing researcher, you can. And don't wait till you're 20 years in your career to do this. You can do it, you know, two years out of your PhD, even while you're a postdoc. So seek out the opportunities to serve and to, to get plugged into the agencies and have a voice in policy. You can uh, testify at hearings. There's lots of other things you can do, join advocacy groups and so on. But the key thing is to, um, I think, to remain very consistent in, 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 in uh, you know, telling the truth and being honest and, and being forthcoming in terms of what you're saying, not be driven by some political uh, ideology. Um, so how do you do it? Well, there's a wonderful guide out there. It's called Working with Congress. Buy, get it try actually it's online free I think you have to pay money if you want a hard copy but maybe it's like 10 bucks uh, but the AAAS American Association for the Advancement of Science publishes this thing and it's fabulous it says okay I'm a researcher that didn't have a clue what I would say if I go in to talk to a member of Congress or their staff what would I say I, you know what do I leave behind it tells you all of that stuff and the point is you, you're brief it's not like the lecture where you start out you know and five minutes before the end of the lecture the aha moment comes, you're like, punchline, you know, and people leave and they're all happy. It's just the opposite. You don't, you don't lead them for 5, five 10, 15 minutes. You, you get in there and you say what you want to say, 10 minutes later, you're gone probably. So it has to be very crisp. You've heard about what's the elevator speech or by research. And I would encourage you, those of you in grad school, even postdocs, if you were walking down the hall with a member of Congress and had 30 seconds, what would you tell them about your work? If you can't put it into that framework and help it be understandable and not use 16 syllable words that are in Latin that are, you know, microbes or whatever, you know, you're, you're probably in some trouble. So I would really encourage you to think hard about that because we as researchers have to put our work not only in understandable terms but in a context. They said, that's great. That's what you do. But why is that important for our nation? Tell me. I, I'm a, you're a constituent of my district. I, I love what you're doing. I'm so excited. But what do we do with it? Why is it valuable? What's the purpose? Not is it going to create jobs, but why are you doing it? What's the purpose? So think hard about those things and how you actually communicate them. You know, Lincoln had a great quote, public sentiment is everything. You know, it, it's truly everything. With it, nothing can fail. Because you get the public energized and behind something, but without it, nothing can succeed. It's all about, the, and this is what Joe does, you know, Joe Ritbarger and his work, he, he looks at public sentiment, public attitudes. And so, yes, there are lots of polls and things like that. But at the end of the day, your particular piece of work isn't being done in isolation. You're part of a larger ecosystem of research, not only in the Climate Science Center, but broadly, even more broadly, how does your work fit into the bigger picture? If you don't know that, and it's okay if you don't, talk to folks and figure it out. Figure out what your role is, what your little piece is. We all have two or three pieces of the puzzle, right? They're weird shapes. Oh, this looks like a corner piece, you know. None of us have the box top where we see the whole picture of the puzzle. None of us have that. So it's important to take your piece and try to figure out what the box top looks like. The Climate Science Center sort of is a box top, but it's 
it's, it's part of a box top in terms of bigger box tops, of pictures of puzzles on box top. So try to piece that together and figure out where you, where you fit in the role you play. So finally, I would just say we have to do a much better job of communicating our work, as I just said, the purpose and the value. And where we really have fallen off the, the track, especially in climate, we tend to talk to the public and not with them. And we tend to immediately, and I think Joe mentioned this, something about religious values and things like that, religious beliefs. Look, you can't just go in and tell somebody, you know, this is the way it is, folks. This is the way science works. You're, you're dead on arrival, and you should be, frankly, because it, you don't value other people's opinions. We have to listen, okay? We have to listen, and we have to communicate. And in, in fact, in a lot of cases, what science tells us does conflict with people's core beliefs. And we can't just say, well, they're idiots. If the public were just smart, if they just had a master's degree, if they just went to the university, if those idiots in the public would just get it, life would be good. And that's the attitude of a lot of people, especially with climate science. Totally wrong approach. You would not be appreciated. <laughs> Or you would not appreciate somebody saying that to you. So why in the world do we say it to people? We do that a lot. So we have to, look, science is about respecting opposing views and getting in there and arguing, 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 and letting the research tell the story. For some reason, as Joe said, you know, some people just get vilified if they even bring a topic up. If you're in a situation like that, somebody is so adamant that their view is right and you're an idiot, walk away. Walk away. Don't have the conversation with me. It's not going to be valuable, okay? It's valuable when you can enter into a dialogue. Or, instead of walking away, see if you can get them to enter into a dialogue with you. That will be an even better outcome if it's possible. But sometimes it's very, very difficult. So engaging the public, uh, my goodness, I've given talks at Kiwanis Rotary. I've given talks at nursing homes. I've given talks at dorm floors and things like that. It's time well spent. Go to church groups. Give talks about what you do. Again, not to tell them, here's how it is, folks, but to say, here's what my research shows. I'm interested in your thoughts. Let's talk about this. Especially at church, I would challenge you to do that. It's fascinating. It's really fascinating to do that. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, that's it. Hopefully that's useful to you to kind of give you a sense of policy, what it is, how it's, you know, how it's made. Again, the entire course is taught. But I guess my bottom line message is we all have a role to play. And you as scientists coming through the ranks, you know, getting your degrees or postdocs, the Climate Science Center gives you an incredibly wonderful opportunity to be on the front ends of, I think, one of the most important scientific policy issues of our time. And so seize the moment. You know, seize the moment. And you have folks here, including myself. I'm, I'm part of OU. I'm here to help you, be, you know, however I can be helpful. If you want to engage in this in some more formal way than you're doing, let me know. I want to be helpful. But I think the Climate Science Center as an entity among all of them in this country, this one is at the pinnacle. I mean, I'm so excited what the South Central Center is doing because it's got great leadership. It's got great folks in it. You know, be bold. Be bold and go out and do really creative good things, not only in your research, but understanding the context of what you're doing and the value proposition for society. So I'll end there, and if we have to, and I totally gave a lecture, right? Nobody asked a single question. Nobody threw a single thing at me. But uh, as my, my voice is surviving here. Uh, any questions uh, you want to ask? I'm ready. I'm just going to turn the lights up here. And...